All right, so please welcome to the stage Reverend Matt with Reverend Matt's Monster Science. Thank you. Hi, I'm Reverend Matt, and some of you may remember my presentation at this conference last year, 28 Godzilla Movies in 28 Minutes. And, and it's thorough but high-speed metatextual analysis of Toho Studios' Godzilla series. Ever since then, people have been coming up to me and saying, Reverend, but what about the other Toho Kaiju films, the ones with monsters that would cross over with Godzilla? Why do you withhold them from us? <laughs> Why? Is it to teach us self-reliance? It won't work, and so on. Constantly, people say this to me, calling me at 3 o'clock in the morning, it's got to stop. <laughs> So today I present Destroy 60% of Available Monsters, a comprehensive overview of Godzilla's friends and relations outside of his own series. Most of these monsters started off in their own films and then were folded into the Godzilla series, much as the superhero movies are doing these days. And it's a solid concept. People really go for world building. Toho did not invent it, of course. It was invented by Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. <laughs> The first of these Toho films was 1956's Sora no Dai Kaiju Radon, or Radon, Giant Monster of the Sky, released later in the US as Rodan the Flying Monster, or if we take its punctuation seriously, as of course we should, Rodan <laughs> the Flying Monster. <laughs> it was the first Toho Kaiju film in color, and the third overall after 1954's majestic topical Godzilla and 1955's Godzilla's counterattack, which was not so much majestic and topical as it was a cash-in and stupid. <laughs> Rodin is on neither end of this spectrum, but is instead a fairly unexceptional workmanlike kaiju film. It starts off with some miners being killed off one by one. That's something that by something that leaves them with huge slashing scars before anyone can quite reasonably start pinning this on vengeful samurai ghosts, Wolverine, or really any maniac with a sword. The culprit is revealed to be Mega Nulons, giant prehistoric dragonfly larvae that are wildly misrepresented here, but shut up. <laughs> Before they can transform into actual giant dragonflies and everybody wishes it had just been He-Man, they are all eaten up by a freshly hatched Rodan. Rodan is, of course, a giant pterosaur. Its Japanese, it's, his Japanese name, Radon, is in fact a, contra a contraction of Terra Nadon, which made it resonant and meaningful to nobody whatsoever. <laughs> he is, of course, considerably larger than a regular pteranodon, and also flies at supersonic speed, because since an animal that size couldn't even actually stand up, much less fly, we might as well just go for it. <laughs> anyway, Rodan, and then a second Rodan, fly around, are mistaken for foreign secret weapons, which indicates that the 1950s are maybe much more interesting than they're generally given credit for. <laughs> They destroy Fukuoka and then fall into an erupting volcano for inadequately explored reasons. <laughs> Though this is not the finest kaiju film ever made, Rodan would go on to appear in a number of Godzilla films because Rodan is totally awesome. <laughs> Indeed, were it not for a late 70s toy Rodan in the Shogun Warriors series, Sorry. Whoa. empowered by innovation, <laughs> NEC. Anyway, moving on. Yeah. Yay! Yes, yeah, three cheers. Um, indeed, were it not for late 1970s Toy Rodan in the Shogun Warriors line, being pictured in a Sears Christmas catalog for me to gaze upon its startling length in my youth, I probably would not be standing here today. Instead, I would perhaps have interests that provided me with money or social status. If you if you listen closely, you can hear my mother weeping. <laughs> Moving on. Yes. 
I'll, moving on, as I say. 1958, I'll let you mess with this and I'll just continue. Yes, please do. It'll be fun. Um, 1958 saw the release of Daikaiju Baran, released in the US as Baran the Unbelievable. This film, though made by the same director, producer, and team in general that had made Godzilla, Rodan, and many of the rest of these films, yeah, that's not it at all, um, was originally intended for American television rather than Japanese cinema until US co-producers pulled out. Perhaps it is for this reason that this movie is so amazingly flimsy. Some scientists and reporters go to a remote Japanese lake to investigate unusual bu butterflies and instead find Baran, which must have been very disappointing from an entomological point of view. <laughs> I'm just gonna... Yeah, just I'm just gonna take a pause here. I'm just going to plow on that, on forward. Oh, okay. It's just, start talking. Start talking? Yeah. No, the computer is Let me know. How are y'all doing out there tonight? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, yeah. This is, I love Minneapolis. Pictured here. There we go. Um, which kaiju do instinct instinctively, of course, though it is difficult to imagine what evolutionary advantage this provides. Mating, mating display, clumsy nest building. More money needs to be spent on kaijuology. Anyway, the army mobilizes a lot. This is mainly just a movie about army mobilization when Baran's not on screen. And if that sounds interesting to you, then you're wrong and stop it. <laughs> <laughs> and then Baran attacks Tokyo and they trick him into eating explosives. The end. There's no message here, no interesting subtext, no real human drama. There is a pretty good looking giant lizardy monster though, and there are his patagia, which suddenly appear at one point and allow him to fly. <laughs> These were cut from the American version because we're cowards. <laughs> interesting though, that the first two independent kaiju after Godzilla should be flying creatures. It was almost as though things that came out of the sky would be frightening to Japanese people in the years following World War II. <laughs> Though history does not record why this might be. <laughs> Baron would go on to appear as a minor background character in Destroy All Monsters, which may sound ignominious, but frankly, being a minor background character in Destroy All Monsters is better than, any than anything anybody in this room will accomplish in their entire lives. <laughs> The non-Godzilla Toho Kaiju films finally hit their stride with, that's right, Mothra in 1961. This is quite a good film with real humor and drama, a compelling villain, excellent messages about environmentalism and atomic power, and two tiny little women who sing a song that summons a gigantic moth. <laughs> It even has religious commentary. Toward the end of the film, the protagonists realize that Mothra's symbol, pictured here, is similar to the Christian cross, and that church bells peel a tune similar to traditional Mothra worship songs. This is passed off as the unity of all religions, but of course we can see the truth. Christianity is ultimately based on Mothra. <laughs> This film also does something important that no Japanese kaiju film has managed so far. It casts Americans as the villains. Japan at this point had been a close ally of America for many years. We'd rebuilt their economy. Everything was A-OK -okay between us. The thing was, a little bit previous, we had dropped some atomic bombs on them, introducing a terrifying new holocaust upon the earth, and some of them were still being crybabies about that. <laughs> And so, 
For all their nuclear allegory, the previous kaiju films hadn't mentioned where it had come from. Indeed, it is possible that, ja that Japan's necessarily ambivalent attitude towards the source of Fat Man and Little Boy is part of the reason that they mythologized the bomb in Godzilla, made it a horror of legend rather than a weapon of war. But the film Mothra finally gets around to some culpability. Not directly, its capitalistic villains, who test atomic weapons wantonly and imprison the two tiny women, are from Rolisica. But the allegory is obvious. Rolisica is across the Pacific. Its major metropolis is New Kirk City. Wink. I, I could have just winked, but I wrote down wink, so I just said it. And when we... And when we get to Rolisica, everybody just sort of has guns. <laughs> they had our number. The giant moth would go on to be the first kaiju to cross over with Godzilla in 1964's Godzilla vs. Mothra, and for, or rather Mothra vs. Godzilla. And from there she would appear in several other films. She is certainly the second most popular kaiju in Japan, the hero and force for good in the Godzilla pantheon. A team of sociologists working around the clock would take months to figure out why exactly this is, but I can offer this. Mothra spends a lot of time in her, mar in her larval form, which is gross and weird and undulates horribly, and is again, good. <laughs> like Captain America. It also specifically resembles a silkworm, which perhaps explains the positive attitude towards it. Silk, of course, being closely associated with comfort and beauty or in this case, Colossal City Wrecking Comfort and Beauty. <laughs> Lothra was released in America in 1962 on a double bill with the Three Stooges in Orbit. <laughs> True. <laughs> Next up is 1963's Kaitei Gunken, meaning undersea, undersea Warship, released in America as Atragon, the name they gave the titular ship in international release for some reason. This film tells the story of the sunken continent of Mu, which is a real sunken continent, if by real we mean made up by an Englishman in the 19th century, <laughs> and its attempt to gain dominance over the surface world. The only one who can save us is Imperial Captain Jinguji, missing since the war. When our other heroes find him, they learn two things. The first thing is that he doesn't want to help because he is a fanatical Japanese nationalist and all he wants to do is win World War II after all. It's interesting to see this story from a Japanese perspective. We often hear the story of Hiro Onoda, the Japanese soldier who hid out in the forest in the Philippines for years after the war, refusing to believe it was over. I've always thought the strangest thing about this story was that he was allowed to do this by the locals. I mean, he wasn't the crazy old man in the forest. He was the crazy old man in the forest who wanted to kill us. But I digress. <laughs> I'd only ever heard this story from the American perspective, and from there it becomes a continuation of the wartime narrative of the Japanese being people who would rather die than surrender, their babies waving knives at us from their very bassinets, and so we really have to use the A-bomb, we have no other choice. So it's interesting to see this sort of nationalism was not just our propaganda, but enough of a concern in Japan to make a movie about it, and also about lost continents and such. The second thing we learned about Jinguji is that he has a totally sweet ride. <laughs> Atragon is a submarine. It has a freeze ray. It can fly for some reason. It has an actual friggin' grill in the front of it. Remote keyless entry, leather seating here, take a first spin. <laughs> there is also a kaiju in this movie, Manda, a sort of giant Asian dragon, and very much the afterthought that I've implied here. <laughs> Manda is Mu's enforcer. He is summoned when our heroes have kidnapped the Mu e an Empress and uh, brought her to a diving suit storage locker to escape the sunken land. While they are donning their suits, she backs up and presses the Manda summoning button there in the storage locker. <laughs> I mean, that's just building code. Manda attacks Atragon briefly and ineffectively. It has been said they decided to make this kaiju a dragon in honor of the Year of the Dragon. I suppose we should be happy then that this movie didn't come out the previous year. <laughs> Manda would go on to appear and destroy all monsters attacking London in spite of the fact that his horns had fallen off. He also fights Godzilla in a scene deleted from the movie, presumably del deleted because it was super lame. Our next movie is 1956's Frankenstein Taichite Kaiju Baragon. 
meaning Frankenstein versus subterranean monster Baragon, and known in the West as Frankenstein Conquers the World. <laughs> Frankenstein does not, of course, conquer the world in this movie, or anything really. But if you're going to use the if you're going to not use the original title, I suppose this sounds better than Frankenstein wrestles a lizard. <laughs> Here again, unlike the main Godzilla series, we contend with the aftermath of World War II directly. This one begins with the still beating heart of Frankenstein's monster being whisked from Germany to Japan in order for it to be used to create bulletproof soldiers. Now, it may seem like literally nothing can go wrong with that plan. <laughs> and yet, the lab that the heart is brought to is in Hiroshima and the timing is bad. <laughs> the heart then grows into a huge, giant Frankenstein's monster. Wait, sorry. <laughs> Who runs off into the hills. He basically doesn't want to hurt anybody, but he does fight a randomly appearing underground monster called Baragon, and then in the international version, a giant octopus that appears entirely without preamble at the end of the movie. <laughs> This was apparently added because it was believed that Americans love giant octopuses. Those Americans. <laughs> Always with the giant octopuses. <laughs> also add for the American release were scenes in which Frankenstein is more violent than he is in the Japanese release. Again, playing to their audience. This keeps happening. They cut a lot of the subtextual stuff out in Mothra, the one they made for us originally, Varan, was the lightest of them all. What I'm saying is that they would dumb down kaiju movies for American audiences. <laughs> now, nobody's saying these movies are Citizen Kane. Well, probably somebody is, but they just want attention. But they are much better than their American maligning would suggest, and part of this seems to be because they were talking down to us, giving us the versions that they thought we could handle. Baragon would later become a background monster and destroy all monsters. Frankenstein, on the other hand, and yes, I am calling the monster Frankenstein, you all know what I mean. <laughs> and therefore language has worked once again. <laughs> Appears again the following year in Frankenstein no Kaiju, Sanda Tai Gaira, or Frankenstein's Monsters, Sanda versus Gaila. In America, it was called War of the Gargantuas. Listen. When I say War of the, you say Gargantuas, okay? War of the Gargantuas! Thank you. But the basic conceit of this one is that some cells of Frankenstein scraped off and regenerated into an evil green ocean-going Frankenstein. <laughs> which, of course, we all saw coming. I mean, they could not make this movie. The original monster, now named Sonda, <laughs> by the military for some reason, is now much bigger and yellow, and he attempts to, pre to prevent Gyla, the evil one, from eating people. He mostly does this by shaking his head at Gyla in a sort of stern disappointment. <laughs> Giant yellow Frankenstein is kind of a humorless scold. This doesn't work, and they fight a bunch. Fun fact, a number of the baseline Godzilla movies, which of course lacked Frankenstein because we live in a fallen world, <laughs> Were released, were released in Germany with the word Frankenstein in their titles, presumably to appeal to local monster pride. Godzilla vs. Gigan, for example, became Frankenstein's Hohenbrut, meaning Frankenstein's Hellspawn. Frankenstein Conquers the World may have been mislabeled, but this is a kind of incorrect that violates several important laws of physics. <laughs> The final non-Godzilla Toho Kaiju film of the classic period was 1967's King Kong no Gyakushu, meaning King Kong's counterattack, and released stateside as King Kong Escapes. And this is the one where the offshoot films achieve the gonzo craziness that the Godzilla series had been working for a few years by now. The characters alone. Okay. <laughs> the villain of the piece, seen here with his truly outstanding hair and cape, is a Bond villain-like character called Doctor Who. <laughs> this bears no connection to the British television show that some people are maybe a little bit into. But nevertheless, 
please contribute to my GoFundMe to purchase the U.S. rights to this film and release it as Doctor Who meets King Kong and then spend the rest of my life lighting cigars with $100 bills. <laughs> By Madame Piranha. And what's her thing? What side is she on? It's gray and ambiguous. Piranha is played by Mie Hama, who appeared in the James Bond series as Kissy Suzuki. Now, Suzuki is a perfectly good Japanese surname, but not a lot of Japanese couples name their children Kissy. <laughs> on the other hand, one thing we know about the Bond universe is that a lot of couples hold their new baby girls in their arms and have weird, weird ideas. <laughs> I'm looking at you, Galore family. <laughs> the Goodhead family, well, I guess there's nothing you can do. <laughs> On the heroic side, there's Commander Nelson, played by Rhodes Reason, who also starred in the American television series White Hunter, which I am just not going to watch. <laughs> The doctor aboard his ship is Susan Watson, and she takes the Fay Ray role, though she may be the first such character to be openly affectionate towards Kong, later explaining their first encounter to a room full of reporters with Watson at his side. Nelson says, Kong is male, and Watson is, well, see for yourselves, gentlemen. Everybody laughs, regretting only that the room could only hold a few dozen people to all sexually harass the doctor at once. <laughs> Then there's monsters. First there's Mechanicong, which Doctor Who is using to dig for ore at the North Pole. Now some might say there's no land at the North Pole, and that maybe a giant ape is not the most optimal design for a mining device, but do these people have this hair? The answer is no. <laughs> Doctor Who then learns about Kong, and vows to replace his machine with the kaiju, because when you're mining, what you really need is an ape. Also there's Gorosaurus, from whom Kong defends Susan, and also a random sea. Yeah, that's Gorosaurus. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I expect better from you. <laughs> <laughs> and then also a random sea serpent that Kong fights, because after mining, the thing apes are second best at is swimming. <laughs> this all happens on Mondo Island, which I think says it all. If you can manage the belief suspension powers of the Godzilla enthusiast, I recommend this one highly. Kaiju Scale Kong had previously appeared in King Kong vs. Godzilla, Gorosaurus would later have a significant role in Destroy All Monsters. Meanwhile, King Kong Escapes re would be released in the States on a double bill with Don Knotts as the shakiest gun in the West. <laughs> Again, true. <laughs> and here things would stand for Godzilla Universe movies for nearly 30 years until 1996, 1997, and 1998 when Toho produced a self-contained trilogy of movies about an enormous fuzzy insect known for its ethical uprightness. These were aimed squarely at children, whereas of course a movie like Godzilla vs. Megalon had been aimed serious, no-nonsense adults and two-fisted street-fighting badasses. But for real, the 90s Mothra trilogy was bright and colorful, broad and simple in its environmental messages, and its human protagonists were themselves children, who were often shuffled aside in favor of screen time for Mothra and the tiny women. Speaking of whom, these are called Elias in this version, and were no longer twins, and in fact numbered three, Mothra's two pals and their sister Belvera, who was evil. <laughs> or as evil as a two-inch tall person can be, which... I guess is as evil as anyone, just not as effectively so. I mean, <laughs> this hamster may love only genocide, but what's it going to do about it? You know? <laughs> the first of this trilogy, called simply Mothra, involves the coming of Death Ghidra, who makes straight up elephant sounds, which is surprisingly distracting, and, and sucks the very energy out of the planet, like Galactus, only without the crazy hat. So disappointing all around, though he does manage to kill Mothra, leaving her to be avenged by her son named, and I am not making this up, Mothra Leo. The badass racing stripes version of the beautiful Fury Moth. <laughs> Say what you like about this trilogy, but these are films that really go for it. 
The second film, Mothra II The Undersea Battle, is similar to the first but a bit more of a mess. There's a pollution dragon called Dagora, an undersea civilization of some sort, a lot of people living around pointlessly. There's also this creature called Gorgo, who, who is incapable of speech, but if this were not the case, one can easily imagine him saying, buy my doll, over and over again. <laughs> Mothra Leo also changes into... Mothra Leo changes into Rainbow Mothra and Aqua Mothra over the course of this picture. <laughs> he does not, however, change into Meat Lover's Mothra or a caffeine-free diet Mothra. <laughs> Mothra 3 King Ghidra attacks is the best one. This is largely because its villain, the titular Ghidra, has always been a badass in the Godzilla movies, even if one time he was defeated largely by jump kicks. And he looks great here, and wreaks much more destruction than we've seen in this series. Plus he's collecting children in a huge pulsating fleshy dome, which teaches us all a valuable lesson about the perils of huge pulsating fleshy domes. <laughs> and he does this by simply flying over the children, upon which they simply distend and fly upwards and disappear like ghosts. It's actually pretty scary. There's also a time travel sequence where Egg McMothra, or whoever he is now, <laughs> goes back in time to Mesozoic to defeat a younger, weaker Ghidra here. Then, when Ghidra in the past is defeated and the present Ghidra then disappears, Belvera, now on the side of good, basically says, wait a minute, if Ghidra was killed in the Mesozoic, why was he just here? Whereupon Ghidra immediately reappears. <laughs> changes into Lightspeed Mothra, Armor Mothra, and Eternal Mothra, which I'm not making up, and Mean Old Cantankerous Mothra, which I am. <laughs> and so we conclude our overview of the non-Godzilla Toho Kaiju canon with all of its open political allegory, simplifying things for Americans, and Mothra. <laughs> Unfortunately, we have no time for Q&A, but let me just answer two questions that I'm sure are on your lips. First, Gamera doesn't count here, friend to all children or otherwise, because his films are put out by a rival studio, Daiei, and the monsters never crossed over. Second, Godzuki also doesn't count. <laughs> Godzuki never counts. <laughs> Thank you. Let's keep it going for Reverend Matt.